Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Springbrook Church of Christ. Uh, we begin our worship as we do this morning, as we do every Sunday morning with our Lamplighters program. It's our family devotional program. Yep, I know. Uh, where we believe that God invites us into his story through what, kids? Reading, singing, and praying together. Right, through reading, singing, and praying together. So, um, we completed our last quarter a week or two ago. Last week was our, was our assessment, our testing. I don't know what we call it. If anyone needs the makeup, the makeup testing this morning, if any of you kids need it, um, right at the start of the sermon, the sermon, come downstairs, and I will be down there to do the makeup testing with you. Um, so we will test you and then send you back up. So if anyone needs that makeup testing, come down. Um, at the start of the sermon with the beginning of the Bible hour this morning. All right. Yes? Did you have a question? Oh, yes. We are going to start our new material. So what does Torah mean? Torah means teaching. Torah means teaching. Very good. And then, what is the Torah? Should we read this together? This is all new material. Do you, do you think you know it? I was going to say that, but... The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. That's right. And then what does Pentateuch mean? This is a red one. Should we read it together? One, Greek term, Greek term meaning five scrolls. Two, another name for the Torah. Good job, everyone. All right. And then what does salvation mean? Salvation means rescue. <laughs> We're in sync here this morning. Uh, and then what do we need salvation from? Does anyone know? Or should we read together? Do you know? God? Uh, let's read together. We need salvation from sin and its consequence, death. And then the red. What did, God, what did Israel consider the primary example of God re rescuing his people? Let's read it together. God's Passover, his rescue from the 10th plague of Egypt, and escape through the sea. All right, good job, everyone. Go take a seat. Give me a hand. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our worship service this morning. We'll, we'll go over a few announcements. Today is actually a pretty busy day. Right after worship, we'll take five minutes to go over our... Every year we have to go through a, a state-required corporate meeting. It'll take five minutes. And what we'll do is um, re-elect or, I guess, elect officers. And Dirk will lead us through it. It'll, it'll take... It's very quick and easy and painless, hopefully. So um, we'll do that right after worship today. And then there's a, today there's a Women's Day prep event uh, right after worship uh, downstairs. And um, so the other thing that's going on is uh, our children have been preparing for months now to uh, go to... LTC in Richland, and uh, this is their last week of, of preparation before they they'll be going down next week to uh, to Richland to to participate in that. Uh, there's a team of eight of our children that will be that will be uh, going to that. So today will be their last practice. Um, uh, one other thing that. Um, is going on. So the, you'll see in the parking lot some work's been done, uh, a, a new landing place for where the woodshed here will be moved to has been prepared in order to uh, 
prepare the uh, ground that we're having that we have right here for a playground. And on the back, on the left, on the table, you'll see a box that uh, is a ballot box, and um, there's four pictures of the options of playground that we have to choose from. And so next week will be well, this week and next week will be the last week to put it, give your input to that. And you'll, you'll see a little forms there and you can check off, it says first to last, I think, and then just make your choices and then slip it in the box and we'll have good input then for that. And uh, Travis and Ian have been working hard on, on that as well as other people and doing a lot of the work for that. And we thank you for, for all of that. Um, one other thing, um, we have a mailbox on that side of the street right over here on the corner and it keeps getting broke into. And so we've, we've formally tried or made uh, or asking the post, de post office department to uh, forward the mail from our, post, our mailbox here to our post office box. What we don't want any of you to do is use our mailing address to mail in contribution or anything like that because uh, we're giving it away to somebody else if we do that. So, um, so if uh, please please don't use the mailing address, uh, our our address for your mailing, but use the post office box address. Did I make that clear? Okay. <laughs> um, We have lots of people to pray for. There's a, an insert. Oh, Valerie will be back uh, next Saturday, bringing her sister Pam. So, um, so that will be good to have her, her back with us again. Uh, and lots of people to pray for, uh, too. So if you'll pay attention to that in the bulletin. Will you pray with me now? We'll start our worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we're, we're grateful for this beautiful day. Thank you for this family of your believers. Father, we are grateful that you have made us a part of your body here. And uh, we love you so much. And we pray this morning that our, our worship will be pleasing to you. Uh, thank you for your son. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. To see everybody's smiling faces. Everybody look up, smile. All right, now I've seen them. All right, uh, this first song is actually two songs mushed together. So this will be an experiment. <clears throat> this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I want to know Christ and the power of Share in his suffering, conform to his death. When I pour out my life to be filled with his spirit, joy follows suffering and life follows death. <clears throat> Father of mercies, day by day, my love to thee grows more and more. Thy gifts are strewn upon my way, like sand. Sands upon 
the great seashore, Father of mercies, God of love, whose gentle gifts all creatures share, the Good morning to you who, who are here, and good morning to those who are listening online. Our topic of prayer for today is anyone who believes in Christ will not be disappointed, will not be put to shame. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary described the word disappointment as the act or an instant of disappointing, the state or emotion of being disappointed. And the word disappointed means defeat in expectation or hope. For example, when a person hopes for earthly things and realizes that he or she will not be able to get it, this realization will lead to disappointment or it will lead to shame. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 5 that the hope of salvation does not put believers to shame because God's love has been poured out into believers' heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to believers the moment they believe and be baptized in Christ Jesus. The moment a person has been baptized in Christ Jesus, she or he or she will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as it is written in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 38 
Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit himself that God promised to give everyone who believes in Christ as a seal or deposit grantee believer a salvation and as a sign that God present in the life of believers or in his heart. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks and praise be to Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we put our trust of salvation in Christ Jesus, we will not be disappointed or feel ashamed because God's, God's character is unchangeable and his promises are true and will come to pass. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verse 10, the Lord says, in the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end. A long time ago, I told you things that have not happened yet. Uh, when I plan something, it happens, I do whatever I want to do. Having seen that God's plan will happen or will come to pass, we can be rest assured or we can be certain that, that Jesus' promises also will happen and it will come to pass. Jesus says in the book of John, chapter 6, verse 39, that God does not want him to lose anyone who he has given to him, but he must raise them up on the last day. This is what God who sent him wants him to do. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, the spirit is the one gives life. The body has no value, but the word he has spoken are full of his spirit and gives life. In Matthew, 28, 20, Jesus commanded his disciples to teach a new followers to obey everything that he has told them to do. He assured his followers that he will be with them always until the end of the time. And in the book of Revelation 1, 8, Jesus says, he is the Alpha and the Omega, and who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Having said that, beloved, hope of salvation in Christ would not lead to disappointment and is found in God's promises and salvation that comes through or given through Jesus Christ. The hope in earthly things leads to disappointment and shame because the world is under the influence of sins and imperfection. As it is written to us in 1 John 5.19, we know that we belong to God, but one, but the evil one controls the whole world. Amen. Join me in prayer. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God Almighty Father, the creator of heaven and earth, we thank you, O oh Lord, for giving us opportunity to assemble before you today. This is not from us, and we don't know that is going to happen, but it is your mercy, and it is your, you, you giving us opportunity once again. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. 
We thank you for protecting us all this time. Father, let these words that we, you, you give us today, that you're not going to disappoint us. And we believe that you're not going to disappoint us, Father. And you gave us an example when Jesus raised from the dead. And he shows us that there is a life after this. And the reward of salvation, Jesus is waiting for us. And we hope that after we believe in Christ and we, our sins is taken away, and now we are living in a newness of life, Father, be with us, continue to strengthen us, continue to make us focus on the way until we see you again. As we are going to continue in our prayers, O Jehovah, we pray that you continue to be with us, protect us, and those who are coming, Father, have, have, let them come here and join us safely. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, these next couple of songs are going to direct us and kind of lead us towards the time that we take the Lord's Supper and we focus on Christ's sacrifice. Um, this song we're going to sing verses 1 and verses 3. And uh, let's go ahead and stand for this song. <clears throat> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow.
Good morning, church. You know, you know what's going to happen now. I, mean, I think we can do better than that. Good morning, church. Good morning. See, that feels better. I can't be the only one that thinks that. Uh, but it's good to be back with you guys after being out of town last weekend. Um, it's special also that I get to do communion back-to-back times, at least that I'm here. So I appreciate the leadership uh, and those for allowing me this opportunity. Uh, but for communion... When I think about communion, the first word that comes to mind for me is sacrifice. And I've shared this with the congregation before, but um, the word sacrifice is mentioned in over 200 scriptures in the Bible. The word love, I started to count how many times the word love is in the Bible, scriptures, that is. And uh, after I got to 300, uh, I said, we'll just go with over 300 times. Um, which makes sense because it takes a tremendous amount of love for sacrifice to take place. And sacrifice, the definition is the surrender or destruction of something prized or desirable for the sake of something considered as having a higher or more pressing claim. That is the surrender or destruction of something prized or desirable for the sake of something considered as having, <clears throat> having a higher or more pressing claim. And Jesus and his life were that prize. And our opportunity for salvation was that more pressing claim. And God's plan and viewpoint uh, from the beginning demonstrated an unfathomable love for you and me. So as you live your life, you should recognize that you have value, you have worth, you have importance. In all of our flaws, we have worth, we have value, and we have importance. And when you or I or we don't feel the love and respect that we would like to, know that in God's eyes, once again, you have worth, you have value, and you have importance. Because in Christ, we are that more pressing claim. And Jesus died for you and for me. And that's what I want us to think about as we move forward with our communion. So let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Thank you for your son and the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And as we partake of this bread, which represents your son's body, let us do so remembering the great sacrifice that was made for us. Let us do so in a manner that is pleasing unto you. This is our, pre our prayer in Jesus' name. Let us all together say, Amen. Amen.
as we move forward with the offering. And now is the time to give. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the Bible says, uh, the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when we give, it's an opportunity to show our excitement for the blessings we receive on a daily basis. And we should be honored and excited as we are giving back to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible reads, But this I say, he which soweth bountifully, or sorry, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Uh, sometimes I think our brains process that scripture differently. I think sometimes we think that if we sow it sparingly, we'll reap bountifully. We think uh, I will give when I have it instead of giving what I have or what we have. But the Bible says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So let us go on to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Oh. Huh? Fruit of the land. Fruit of, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I guess we should also do the cup. Appreciate that. You know, I feel like this is part of the community. You know what I mean? We're going to do the cup. Let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer for the cup. But that, I think that was sounding pretty good, though. <laughs> Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your son's shed blood. Thank you for the sacrifice that was made for us. And, and thank you for our community this morning helping me out. Uh, uh, as we go ahead and partake of the cup, let us do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let us all together say amen. amen. As uh, everyone in the audience was showing me drinking signs, I was like, what in the world is going on? And, and then I realized it was me, so thank you for that. Um, now I guess we'll go ahead and move forward with the offering. But since we covered that already, I feel like we can just go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, uh, just for your people, for, for the opportunity for us being blessed on a daily basis. We ask that you continue to help us recognize these blessings. We ask that you 
help us to continue to uh, just to give, to give a portion back to you of what you have so richly given to us. And our Heavenly Father, uh, for those that had it on their hearts and minds to give, but are simply unable to at this time, we ask that you bless them so that they're able to give at the next appointed time. Uh, we ask that these funds be used in a manner that's pleasing unto you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let us all together say, Amen. Generally, don't clap, but we can do hand in our motions, right? Is that okay? Um, okay, so good morning. Welcome to Springbrook Church of Christ. I'm Thomas Morris. Glad you're here. Uh, I'm trying to look around and see if we have any visitors or uh, guests. If, if you're visiting, welcome. Um, it's good to see Bahailu here uh, from his many travels and journeys. Uh, brother, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're home. Or I guess away from home. Sorry, you're away from home. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, we are in a new quarter for lamplighters. Uh, you know that because all the kids don't know the answers to the questions uh, anymore, and so they're starting, starting over again. This last quarter, we focused on Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, I like to call that the prologue to the Bible. It's, it's helping you understand what kind of world the Bible is describing uh, who is this God that is the creator of all things, and who are his people? And uh, this quarter, we're going to cover uh, the rest of Genesis and Exodus is kind of the biblical material that we're, we're focusing on. In our adult class, we're talking about Exodus, and so I thought in at least the sermons that I get to deliver, uh, I'm going to be talking about the rest of Genesis, focusing on, on some key stories that maybe, maybe don't get as much attention um, and so today we're going to spend most of our time in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, if you want to move over there with me. The thesis for today, the thing that I, I want to, for you to consider and for us to think about, is that God chooses Abraham and Sarah to bring forth his promised Messiah. Now that might not seem revolutionary, maybe that's very obvious, um, but he's, he, he chooses these two people. And, you know, it wasn't the right time to bring forth the Messiah, and it wasn't the right place and, and, and uh, the, the, the moment when, when Jesus was going to come forth. Uh, but, but he chooses these two people for a reason. They, they have a particular character, and he, he knows that they can bear the seed. They can bear this pattern that he wants to bring forth in the person of Jesus. And so they're the ones, they're, they're the matriarch and the patriarch who, who we look back to as the ones who uh, were faithful and completed this, this, this journey uh, in a way that eventually comes to fruition in the person of Jesus. And in the same way, we're called to forth, or excuse me, we're called to bring forth our own little people that, that are going to bear the image of Jesus, gonna, that are going to grow up and be uh, powerful men and women of God. 
that are going to change and transform the world around them to be more like God's kingdom. And so in this way, we too await Jesus' return, await Jesus' arrival, um, and, and we are faithfully carrying on this pattern after them. So let's look now at, in, in Genesis 18 to, to, to get us, before we start reading it, though, I want to give us some context. Um, the prologue, thankfully, uh, I was thankful for Randy's class this morning. He did a, a quick recap of Genesis itself, so I'm going to go a little bit more in detail leading up to Genesis chapter 18. So like I said, the prologue is, is this, uh, Gen- Genesis 1 through 11 is this helpful uh, understanding of, it's trying to help us understand where we are in the world, who we are in the world, who God is and, and who we are, what, what God did to, to create the world and, and how he brought all things to order uh, and, and who humans are in relation to him. We found out that we're in a good world and that we're uh, creatures which are, which are at the, the pinnacle of, of this, this world that he's created uh, and, and he wants to give us special responsibility, a special role in his creation to rule over the creation with him. Uh, in a way that honors him and in, in a way that he sees fit. Uh, but we choose to define good and evil on our own terms, uh, and, and we end up bringing a curse instead of a blessing onto that creation. And so that creates all this discord and this murder and this uh, just, just backstabbing uh, stories that, that come about in the next, next few chapters of Genesis, uh, ultimately resulting in God wiping creation out through uh, uh, the flood, and bringing, bringing forth kind of a, a recreation after Noah and his ark land. Uh, but we see the same patterns of humans, even after that moment, uh, continuing to, to act in ways that aren't, in aligned, aren't aligned with good will, God's will, including Noah's own sons. And so from there, he calls uh, one particular family, the family of Abram. He calls them out of Haran, and they are blessed in order to bring a, be a blessing, as we see in, in chapter 12. Abraham, uh, he obeys God's calling to, to come out of Haran uh, and leave his family there, except he brings a little bit of his family with him. He brings his nephew Lot, because Abram is married to this woman, Sarai, who's barren. She can't have children. And so Abram, he's called to be a blessing. He's called to bring this blessing into the world. And so he kind of brings Lot almost as an insurance, <laughs> an insurance policy. Uh, he needs an heir, he needs somebody to take this blessing, and, and he needs somebody to take his estate. He needs all the, somebody to, to transfer these things, so maybe it's going to be Lot. We don't know. Um, except we've read, we've read, hopefully we've read this story, so we do know. All right, that, doesn't, that doesn't turn out well. Uh, he ends up down in Egypt. It's one of the first stories we found out about Abram. He ends up down in Egypt, uh, and he comes out of Egypt with so much stuff that he and his, his, that he and his nephew Lot have to separate. And Lot settles in this valley of the Jordan uh, and, and this, this well-watered place uh, that seems like it's the best place to, to be, uh, but it's also near this city called Sodom. And then we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago with the Battle of the Kings, where the, the kings of Canaan rebel against their masters, who are the world, world powers at this time, the, the ones that live up in the land of Babylon. And the kings of Canaan partner with giants, and the but still the powerful kings of the north come and defeat the Canaanites. They loot, plunder, and enslave all the people there, including Lot, who's been living in Sodom. So Abram goes up and he raids these kings. He gets his nephew back. Abram gets a blessing from this priest of Yahweh named Melchizedek, uh, and, in, and, and uh, he's given this covenant from, from Yahweh. God promises Abram uh, that he's going to give him all the land that he sees. So it's not just... It's not just the land that, that he's settled in, but it's also the land of the Canaanites that, that are kind of all around him, occupying the land and living there, uh, you know, living in these evil ways. Uh, and, and he's also going to give him the land all the way from the, from the Red Sea all the way up to the, to the Euphrates River. All, all this land is going to be belong to his descendants. But still, Sarai has no children. And she's been, she's been bare of, barren uh, their, their whole life. God promises he's going to give this land, but, and, and, he's gonna, and he actually clarifies in this first covenant that he's going to give him a son from his own body. Okay? And, and Sarai's still pregnant. Or, excuse me, Sarai's still barren. 
And so they're, 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 they're trying to think this. They, they, they're pretty patient. They wait 10 years, and then Sarai has an idea. You know, I have this, I have this maidservant, uh, and, and you know, in her own wisdom and her own understanding, she goes and gives her maidservant uh, to her husband in order to bring about an heir for Abram. Now, where did this, where did this maidservant come from? Well, we find out she's an Egyptian maidservant. And so all this baggage that Abram keeps bringing with him, he brings Lot down from Babylon, he brings uh, Hagar up from Egypt, all, all these, these people that, that come along with him uh, that, that weren't part of the original plan continue to, to detract from Abram's journey, detract from what God's trying to do with Abram and his family. I think there's an important lesson for us to be garnered there, that we, we often bring, upon, bring along these things that weren't meant to be there, and then we wonder why we're stumbling and fumbling over them uh, when, when it comes down to why we aren't doing God's will. Now again, Sarai gives, gives this woman to her husband, and, and she becomes pregnant, uh, and it's a wonder that that doesn't bring about a lot of you know, really positive outcomes in their family, right? <laughs> uh, this, this is even deliberately framed as, a, as the kind of the same sin as we see in the garden. Abraham listens to the voice of his wife, Sarai. That's the same thing that's said about Adam listening to the voice of his wife, Eve. And so in the same way, Abram fails here and, and Sarai fails here. And, uh, but, but they do have this son, Ishmael. Uh, but we find out that he's not going to be the, the heir. And this is what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 9 if you talk about not all the, the children of Abraham are part of Abraham's family. Right? They're not all children of the promise. This brings division and discord within the family. And it, and it actually turns out Sarai basically tries to murder Hagar while she's pregnant. She casts her out of the, she, she drives her away uh, with, with such harsh, harsh treatment that she'd rather leave the camp. And when you leave the camp, in the, in the middle of the desert, that's death, right? There's no 7-Eleven to go grab a slushie. There's no, there's no you know, easily accessible food or, or resources where you're, where you're going to be sustained, especially if you're pregnant. You're not going to survive in the desert. And so she's driven out into the desert, but God saves her, brings her to a well, and then brings her back under Abram's house. We then find out that Abram enters into a second covenant, <clears throat> And, and interestingly, in the second covenant, it's, it's much the same as the first, but he gets renamed, and he gets renamed into to Abraham. And so just, just a little bit of background, uh, Abram means exalted father. Okay? Now, for ancient people, your name is, is a very important part of, of, of who you are. And you would name your child in, in, in hopes that they would fulfill their name and, and maybe the, the most positive or, or, or righteous way possible. So to be an exalted father would mean that you would have a, a very large family with, with lots of sons and, and, and daughters and, and lots of uh, inheritance to, to give to all of them uh, with all sorts of wisdom and, and righteousness to pass on. But at this point in Abram's life, he is not an exalted father. He's not a father, well, he's, he's, he's a father of, of an illegitimate child, you know, with, a, with an Egyptian slave woman, right? He's, he's, he's not much of, of fulfilling what his father named him for. You can imagine Terah, Abram's father, lifting up his firstborn son, naming him Abram. And it's this moment that's kind of filled with hope and promise. But 100 years later, Abram is just the father of one illegitimate child who was almost murdered by his furious wife. Right? But Abraham means exalted father of many nations, the exalted father of the nations. And so what we see here is that God doesn't see the story in the same, in the same way that we do. God looks at Abram and he says, yep, that's still my guy. And in fact, not only do I see him as the, the exalted father, I see him as the exalted father of, of many nations. He doubles down on his promise. He restates them and he renames Abraham. He creates this circum this covenant of circumcision at this point. And, and the promised child, the, the child that's going to be born to them, Isaac, is going to be born through after this promise of circumcision. Okay? And, and um, you know, th 
there's all this, this strangeness around this, this really awkward, weird practice of, of circumcision, trying to understand what that means in, in relation to God's covenant. Why would he bring about this thing? One, one way to think about it is that this is a severe amount of trust that you're placing in God to allow this to happen to you and to your sons after giving, after, after partaking in this, this covenant. And it's only after you go through this severe ritual that you are then going to bring about more people within that covenant group. It's through, it's, it's, it's through this uh, you know, very challenging and difficult uh, practice that you are going to then uh, be able to bear more children, which are also a part of this covenant. And so Ishmael is born before this covenant, and now Isaac is born after he also renames Sarai to Sarah. Now, Sarai and Sarah both, both basically mean princess. Uh, but he, he clarifies in this second uh, covenant that, that she is going to be the one through whom the, this child is born. And so <clears throat> it's, it's, it's kind of incredible, right? This, this barren woman who's, who's very elderly at this point is going to become the one that is the mother of, of the promised child. She, it says in this promise, she's going to become a nation of, of uh, she's going to become nations and become uh, the, the mother of kings. Uh, one interesting way to think about this is, is uh, you know, imagine, imagine your grandmother. Imagine your grandmother when she was pregnant with your mother. At that point, the, the egg that becomes you is inside of your grandmother, Right? There's this, this long line of continuity and this, this body that becomes more and more people, becomes more and more uh, able to, to, to do things in the world. And so for, for Sarah, she is promised that, that this, this line, this, this promised seed is, is coming through you, through your body. Your body is going to become more body until it brings forth the Messiah. And it's during this promise that Sarah is going to have a son that Abram, Abraham is the one who laughs. Right? Abraham laughs at this promise. And so God tells him to name his child Laughter. Right? You know, very, very poetic. And, and so we have to wonder, you know, does Abraham disclose this to Sarah? It's, it's very probable. He's got good news that she's going to bear a child. She's, <laughs> she's going to have a child, and, and, and that's going to be the promised child that they've been looking for. That's, that's the heir. Um, but, but what we find when we start in Genesis 18 is that we've, we've come along this journey. Abram, Abraham is he's looking for an heir. He wants a son, uh, and they've been, been through all these challenges together. Uh, but it doesn't look like Sarah and Abraham have really reconciled after this, this last issue that they've had. So keep that in mind as we start reading. Genesis 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat down at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Now, just, just pause here a moment. The story is being intentionally ambiguous about this arrival. Is this the Lord that's appearing to Abraham? Is it three men? Is the Lord one of the men? Is it both? It's, 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 it's ambiguous on purpose. It's trying to help us uh, put a spot on our shelves to see that sometimes the Lord shows up as a human. Sometimes he shows up and he even has a meal. And he, and he, and he sits down and he talks and, and interacts with, with Abraham here. Uh, and so hopefully that's a, a helpful uh, preview of, of what he's going to be doing in the work of, of Jesus. Okay, let's keep reading. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you've come to your servant. So they said, do, you, do as you have said. Now, again, it's still not clear whether Abraham knows that this is God or, or angels. This is just Abraham being Abraham. Abraham, if, he, if he's anything, he's hospitable. 
right? He wants to make sure that his guests are taken care of. And this is actually a very common practice when you live in a harsh land. There's very high levels of hospitality between people. And to violate this, this hospitality uh, by, say, I don't know, not giving somebody a place to sleep or, or demanding something from a traveler is considered one of the, the most wicked sins that you could possibly partake in, which is a, a preview of what's going to happen to these uh, travelers when they get to Sodom. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's still ambiguous whether Abraham knows this, but this is the kind of person that Abraham is, and this is what his household does for visitors. And so whether it's angels or whether it's just travelers, Abraham is going to take care of the sojourner within his camp. Verse 6, And Abraham went quickly into the tent of Sarah and said, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. Now, I don't know why our Bible translations do this, why they don't translate some strange term that we don't know what it is, a seah. <laughs> Uh, so, so what a sia is, so three sias is about 20 quarts of flour. Uh, a, a quart of flour weighs about a pound, so you could call it 20 pounds of flour, okay? So your husband bursts into your tent, says, quick, make 20 pounds worth of bread. He doesn't say please. Right? <laughs> yeah, you better, right? Um, but that's a, lot of, that's a lot of bread. That's a lot of cakes, right, for her to make. Okay, let's, let's keep going with Abraham. And Abraham ran to the herd, and he took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. And then he took curds and milk and the calf that he prepared, and he set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now what's missing from this meal? Where's, where's all that bread? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I'll surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were, advanced in, were old, advanced in years. The way of woman had ceased to be with her. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old. Shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but she did laugh. <laughs> now, note here that Sarah's reaction is the exact same as Abraham. It's the exact same. They, they <laughs> oh, Sarah's going to be pregnant. All right, cool. All right. Um, but again, names and destiny. Is Isaac, the son of laughter, is he going to be this, this derisive laughter of the scorner and, and this laughter of unbelief? Or is he going to be a, the laughter that's, that's characterized by joy and contentment and and, and the knowledge that God has blessed you with something that's beyond yourself. This is the core of our story, for us even, as Christians. We believe in the God who brings life out of death. When, when we think about this, this miracle that happens with Sarah and Abram, that, that, that they conceive and have a child at this age, this is not possible through our normal, rational, natural understanding of the world. It's just not. The oldest person even today to have ever given birth was 73. God bless her. Um, but that was through in vitro fertilization, and it was with a cesarean section, right? So, so it's, it's only through modern technology and surgeries that this is even, even possible, right? N neither of which have been available to anyone until very recently. You know, that you, could, you could used to do a, a cesarean section, but you would kill the mother, right? You, you could rescue a baby that way. Um, but, but the mother would certainly die. And so for us, we need to look at this story through their eyes, seeing that God brings life from a place of death, from a place that, that everybody else had written off, including the man and the woman to whom the promise had been given. And so for us, too, we hope for the child of promise. We, you know, we're approaching Mother's Day next month, 
Fathers, just yeah. heads up. <clears throat> um, I don't know, and I don't know what your relationship to that day is, especially the women in here. I don't, you know, maybe you hope to be a mother, or the the men hope to be a father, um, but maybe those dreams aren't happening, or or they're they're not happening in the way that you kind of foresaw them. Maybe, um, you know. It seems like it seems like that's that that promise is, is slipping away or slipped away in some way, through loss or death or estrangement. But I have good news for you. That we belong to this story. That that God is the God of miracles, and His family needs mothers and fathers more than anything. All the stories in Genesis are about fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. They're all about how to be the fathers and mothers that God wants you to be. How to be a son or a daughter that, that is in line with the character of your heavenly father. And so to, to be a part of this story means that you're paying attention to these details. You're paying attention to who Abraham is, who Sarah is, and who they're becoming, and who God wants them to be. He wants them to be the kind of mother and father that trust that even though it seems like all is lost, that he's still going to bring this life out of death. And he's still going to be the one who takes them and, and be, they're going to be the mother and father that bring about this nation that we are now a part of today. And so for, for, for us, that means that, you know, I know three or four couples personally who thought that they would never have children. And, you know, doctors told them that it was impossible. <laughs> and now they, they have children, Right. And so just because it seems impossible doesn't mean that it is. But, but even if that, it's not a possibility, even if you're, you're past that point, the fact is, is that we need godly mothers and fathers within this body here today. There are, there are people here that don't have mothers and don't have fathers that could absolutely need your help. And this is a, this is a family, if it's anything. And so I, I would encourage you to connect more closely, to reach out, not to... Not to shut that part of yourself off as, as is kind of encouraged in the world, but to open yourself up to this body and to see how much you could be a mother and a father or a brother and a sister to the people here in this place. The miracle of Isaac's birth points forward to the miracle of Jesus' birth. And, and Jesus' birth and, and all births point to just the miracle of birth and the mystery of life in general. Eight billion people alive today on this planet all because of this amazing and mysterious miracle. Let's finish by reading this, uh, this portion, uh, this last half of this chapter, um, which, is, which is more focused on Abraham. Because now the visitors are going to turn their eyes on Sodom, and we're going to turn our eyes to, to Abraham and, and what he's doing here. Verse 16. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of earth shall be blessed by him? For I've chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. And then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I'll go down to see whether they have all have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So notice a couple things as we're reading through here. Does God say he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? No, he doesn't say that. He says he's going to go check it out. He's heard some bad things. He's going to go find out if this report is true. Now, does the God, omniscient God <laughs> need to go check out uh, uh, need to go, you know, figure out exactly what's going on in so Sodom and Gomorrah? No. But he's inviting Abraham to participate in his business. He's inviting Abraham to participate in this righteous judgment of this wicked place. He wants to understand who Abraham is and what he uh, is, is going to be doing. Because part of Abraham's training and his own job description is to be to ruling, to becoming a nation that carries out God's righteous judgment and his mercy. And so Abraham begins bargaining in verse 22. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. 
Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the righteous 50 who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. Oh, okay. So, little, you know, very bold of Abraham to, to go, but that's kind of what God has participated him to, or, or asked him to participate in, is this judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. But notice, <clears throat> um, first, who are the righteous people in Sodom that Abraham is worried about? It's supposedly Lot and his family, right? He, he knows that they're in there. He cares for them. That's his nephew. That's, that's his nephew's family. Um, it's also one of his backup plans still, just in case this, this miracle child doesn't work out, maybe. Um, <clears throat> but also notice who has decided that Sodom's punishment is wiping it off the face of the earth. It's Abraham, right? Abraham knows what goes on in Sodom. He knows amongst whom his nephew is living. And he knows that if God goes down to Sodom, that the only, the only right thing to possibly do is, is you've got to wipe that place out. Now, it reminds me a lot of John's sermon a few days ago, when, or a few uh, weeks ago, when he was talking about Jonah and his conclusions about Nineveh. Is there a place for repentance among Sodom and Gomorrah? And what's Abraham's role in bringing about repentance or bringing about change or bringing about God's righteous judgment? What about Lot? Let's keep reading. Verse 27. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I, am, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it for if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose... Forty are found there, he answered. For the, for the sake of forty, I will not do it. And then he answered, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there, and he answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I've undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there, and he answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. And then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there, and he answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, this interaction is a very common way that, that people, even today in the Middle East, speak and, and interact, and, and even other places. It's this kind of uh, indirect communication, beating around the bush, very humble, careful, testing things out. Um, so this is, this is not out of the ordinary for, for somebody to do a, a negotiation or a bargaining this way. Now, for us, it's, it's a surprise to see Abraham negotiating with the God of the universe uh, and, and, and how many righteous people he needs to find in this city not to de destroy it. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, this, this is not, uh, not uh, a strange way to communicate. But what is interesting is the pattern that we see here. Let's, let's count them up. So he first asked for 50, and then he asked for 45, and then he asked for 40, and then 30, 20, 10. So he asked six times, and he gets down to ten. If he had asked one more time, zero. And that's the seven, that's the divine number. And so this story almost seems like Abraham could have saved this, this destruction and maybe could have had a different thing, but, but it turns out that this isn't the path for, for Sodom and Gomorrah, and this was the judgment that was reserved for, for these wicked people. And so we're, I'm not trying to, to, to you know, play guessing games or, or rewrite the Bible, but I do want you to notice these patterns. And I want you to notice what you learn about the exalted father of many nations as well as our God, Yahweh. I think that this story is telling us that God wants to save sinners. He wants to bring his mercy instead of his judgment upon people. He wants and he needs partners who are willing to go down with him into the dark places and to shed their light, to spread their light, 
to bring people into the light so that they can see the wickedness of their own deeds and change and repent and become light themselves. He wants Abraham's children shining like stars in the skies. That's part of, that's part of his covenants with him. And if we're to let our light shine, then we have to bring those lights into the darkness. Too often we keep our lights burning low when we're in the darkness, and it's only when we come here on Sunday mornings that we crank up the volume to 11. We throw on the, the bushel throughout the week. Abraham was the beginning of this project. But we have to remember that Jesus was the end. He was the purpose that we were looking for. Jesus is the miracle child whose birth was truly a miracle, but also his resurrection from the dead is the true pattern of this death, out of this death coming life. And so Jesus is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father and brings God's righteous judgment and his mercy in the right way. Jesus is the one that we pledge our allegiance to and our loyalty to and model our lives after so that we can too become like stars in the sky. The last part that we're going to do today is an invitation. It's an invitation if you need prayers because you are hurting or struggling. If you're struggling with those things that I talked about earlier, your, your role uh, either within this body or within your own family or, or in the world, um, we, we understand that those things are hard. The, the burdens that this life and the burdens that people can put on you um, are, are often too heavy to bear. Let us know if you're feeling that way because we want to unload you of those burdens. We want to stand with you and walk with you and pray with you and help you to, to stand up underneath God's promises and, and really connect and grow uh, with us in this family. If you need prayers because you're choosing things that God doesn't want for you, or if you know you ought to be doing something and, and you aren't doing it, let us know now or tell a trusted friend afterwards because we want to pray with you and we want to help uh, bring you to repentance. We're all going to be praying here shortly for repentance for those things that we have failed at this week. We're praying for faithfulness in the week to come. Lastly, if you've not been adopted into this family, we want to know that too because we think there's plenty of room for you here uh, at this table and within this worship assembly. Whatever your needs are, uh, please make them known as we stand and as we sit. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord O oh my soul
ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the soul, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Please be seated. Let's pray. After this prayer, please stick around um, for our business meeting. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for um, this time that we got to come here to worship you, uh, to commune with you, with one another. Lord, help us to remember your son as we go through this week. Help us to pledge our allegiance to him in all the ways that we need to. Lord, forgive us for those things that we've fallen short with this week. Help us understand why things in our lives are the way that they are. Help us to identify and understand what Sarah and Abraham were going through, walking faithfully at your direction for so many years, waiting and waiting and waiting, and it never seemed to come, Lord. We pray for our patience. We pray for your mercy and your grace uh, to fill us up. We pray for a continued blessing from you and, and from one another as we walk through this life together. We pray that you would continue to bring the blessing of your son to us and that we wouldn't keep it here in this place or even within our own homes, but that it could overflow into the people that we come into contact throughout this week, that it would run over uh, until it was a good portion, that they would see that blessing and want to be a part of it too. We pray these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Who's leading the business meeting? All right, quickly, we've got just a couple couple minutes to go over something. This is our um, annual meeting uh, to fulfill a requirement for the state, the state of Washington. To the state of Washington, you are part of a corporate nonprofit. Um, but I think of you guys as part of my spiritual mama. You, you, you guys are part of the church here, right? But for them, uh, it's a corporate nonprofit. And um, um, we have our elders are listed as the, the governors. And so what we have to do each year is we have to have a, a meeting. We have to elect uh, governors that will be listed uh, on the state's website for us, uh, this corporate nonprofit. And so we have to um, elect uh, governors each year. So um, what I'd like to do is open the floor to um, for nominations for governors for this year, for 2024. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have a second. Okay. So we have um, a mo motion to, to um, re-elect the same governors and, and a second. Um, let's see. Check my notes here. Um, is there any discussion or anything about that? Does anyone have any comments I'd like to make? Um, if, if there's not, uh, would all in favor of the motion as stated please indicate by saying aye. Aye. 
Right. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Um, with that, we have fulfilled our requirement to the state of Washington. Um, yes. Thank you. We can now be adjourned from our meeting. Okay. Thank you very much.